there's a uh, we're back we're live we're live uh we're not taking any viewer calls today though um as we discussed maybe in the summertime we should try to do this a couple live uh episodes i think that would be fun because uh you're you're really smart you're really quick on your feet and i'm good at making jokes so i think that would go really well so mannequin chills back you got at charles chill ffb uh scott connor uh, you can find him right there where I just said. Uh, it's also under his name. He writes for DLF. He does uh, Chasing the Helmet podcast and Dynasty and Chill. You got me. Shane is the worst. Um, yeah, I do stuff too. I write for DLF and Dynasty Trades HQ uh, podcast. And then, of course, the show, Mannequin Chill. So we're getting close to playoff season. And uh, I guess we just wanted to talk some playoff stuff um, and we'll just see where that goes. Now, while we were talking off air, you mentioned that you have a strategy that you don't think gets discussed enough. So I want to hear about this. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing us in, Shane. I tell Shane to do the intro to the show because it's just more entertaining. I mean, I sit here and I just kind of want to smile the whole time when he's doing the intro. It's so off the cuff and official. Uh, I love it. So thank you. I uh, hope you're doing well. Been a couple weeks, as always. I think we always apologize for not having a show last week, but then we know dang well we're going to come back like two weeks later and do the same thing again. Uh, so this is right before Thanksgiving, and this is usually the kind of the sign for me every year that like the season is starting to get near the end. Like Thanksgiving week is really like the last week for a lot of trade deadlines. Uh, we can go into talking about whether trade deadlines are good or bad, or you know what the strategy is if you have one or don't have one, but. Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to bring up, you mentioned some live shows and stuff. Who knows where Mannequin Chill is going to go? We want to continue this more regularly in the off season. We were just talking about before we started that it's hard during the season to digest everything that just happened and everything that is happening this week. There's so much that you could pre pretty much change from a week to week basis. It's really hard to put it into a show format and stay consistent with different content. But one thing I wanted to bring up today is I think if you listen to a lot of podcasts, if you read DLF content, you probably hear people talking about whether I'm a contender or a pretender, right? So Shane is the worst. Shane's usually at the very bottom and most in every league because Shane's the worst. So Shane knows what it feels like to be a pretender in a lot of dynasty leagues, right, Shane? Yes, that's that's a shame. I, I look, I didn't, I didn't give myself this name. You know what I mean? Like this was, this was from losing multiple fantasy leagues. That like I, I, I pretty much was I had to have it permanently uh, embedded as my uh, my Twitter handle. So yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Nah, well, Chain Chain does his share of winning too. Otherwise, he wouldn't be as sharp as he is. But just to bring it up, I think you've probably heard many people talk about I'm a contender, or I'm a pretender, right? Do I sell? Do I buy? What's the strategy? And I don't want to say that that doesn't have value, but I think it's different in every league. I think if you're going to go and try to sell, there's some leagues where honestly, where I've tried to sell and it's almost like the league's pretty much saturated. Everybody that's already wanted to buy something has already purchased. So it's hard to sell. You know, I, there's many, there, there's probably four or five leagues where I'm basically out of it. And whether I have an agenda of trying to lower my draft position or rid some potential points off my team, I'm putting out there, hey, these players are available. And it's it's not even an offer. You know, maybe it's people know, maybe I'm a shrewd trader or they know what they send isn't going to get accepted. But just very few offers come in the door on players that I'm just trying to get rid of. Uh, my goal is not necessarily to get value for the players. It's just to get them off my roster for one reason or the other. And the same with buying. You know, there's leagues where I will send offers to players as an aggressive buyer. Clearly a team that's, you know, three and eight should probably be selling Antonio Brown, but they won't budge. They'd rather just have him sit on their team right into the off season. So we're not going to talk about buying and selling. What I want to ask you about and discuss is the idea of personally, I have a lot of teams, probably about half of my portfolio right now of teams are sitting anywhere from like third to sixth place. Okay. So I don't have a lot of teams that are completely terrible. But I don't have a lot of teams that are like 11 and 0, 10 and 1, first place, already have a buy locked up. I have a lot of like third to sixth place teams. So they're probably going to make the playoffs. But if I truly look at my team, there's probably a team in one of those leagues that scored 100 or more points than me. 
So I'm not the favorite. You know, let's just assume a 12 team league where six teams make the playoffs, right? By the math, one out of six, you should have about a 17% chance to win the title. But I'm probably looking more at these teams that are, you know, the fifth seed. A, I have to probably play a first round game where the top two teams are going to get a bye. So I'm probably looking at 10% at best to win the championship from the five or six seed. So my my question and what I wanted to bring up was the idea of being able to kind of operate right on that margin of like, hey, I have a fifth seed team probably going to make the playoffs unless I just have a couple injuries and I lose the next two games. You know, I pretty good chance I'm going to get in the playoffs, but I'm not going to get a bye. So how do you operate on that margin chain? Have you ever thought about like you have a fourth or fifth place team you don't think can get it done? Like it's not a true favorite where you just want to keep adding depth and keep reinforcing every single roster hole that you have. Maybe consider like selling some players on those teams, knowing that, hey, my margin to win is probably five to 10% anyway. So if I have seven receivers and I can only start five, maybe I kick one of those to the future and trade for a pick knowing that I, I still need everything to go right for me to win anyway. You ever thought about anything like that? I, I think it's fascinating. It's a strategy that I've found myself trying to do where I look and I set a roster. I go into week 12, I set my roster. I'm like, dude, I have pretty good depth on this team. Now, maybe I need that depth if I get to the finals or the semifinals. But man, can I maybe sell one of those players and get their market value for a future pick or a package of picks or something like that and kind of secure myself for the future but it doesn't really ding my odds of winning right now. Does all that make sense? Uh, completely. Um, so when you have players on your rosters, say like a uh, Kalen Balaj, Salvan Ahmed, um, that right now you, you look and you go, well, these are guys I can plug in. I mean, that's, that's 12 to 16 points. I'm, I'm the five seed. This is going to help me make the playoffs. I'm actually looking to sell those guys. Um, because you know, I'm I'm still thinking long term. Now there's a t- there's a time to go for it, but when I'm the five seed, six seed, I don't think that's the, the time to go for it. Unless of course there's been injuries and a bunch of my guys are coming back healthy. Um, but I don't even know. I don't, I can't even off the top of my head think of any players that have really been out that are going to be difference makers that are coming back. Joe Mixon maybe, but we don't even know when he's going to be back. And Christian McCaffrey for two weeks. Maybe if you know I've got Christian McCaffrey. On my roster, I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna hold a little. I'm gonna hold out a couple more weeks and go. You know what? Because this guy's a monster. He can win a week by himself. So I'll hold on to Kalen Kalen Balaj. I can't even say his name right. I don't even. I tell little respect I have for him. Um, I'd sell those guys, um, especially at wide receiver. We've talked about this before. Wide receivers a rotating replaceable piece um, except for three, four, maybe five guys at the top, but they're all replaceable. So I have no problem selling any of those players. And frankly, I don't have a problem selling any players off of a a bottom, bottom playoff, uh, a team that's barely going to squeak into the playoffs because like you said, the chances of winning aren't great. I need everything to break right. And, you know, can it happen? Yes. And everybody remembers that time that they won is the sixth seed. And, you know, Yahoo had them down, uh, you know, had them, you know, scheduled to lose by 160. And somehow they came back and won the title. That's awesome. But th- that's few and far between. Um, I still like thinking long term. I'd rather get the stronger assets that I can make this a stronger team next year where I'm not depending on a Kalen Balaj or a, a Salvan Ahmed to uh to get me through the playoffs um you know if those are depth guys great but if i if i have to consistently start them then i I probably have issues um even considering you know injuries and things like that everyone has injuries every year well and it's easier at the running back position because one of the advantages of running backs is you usually have a pretty good idea of when you're going to play them and when you're not you mentioned Kalen Balaj. Like I have Kalen Balaj probably locked into eight or nine lineups this week. If Austin Eckler comes back, he's coming out of almost every one of those lineups. There's really not going to be a middle ground. There isn't a well, I'm going to still maybe flex him. It's not, I probably have a better option, especially if those teams are still in the mix to make the playoffs. I probably have a better option. So I guess the idea I'm thinking of is, you know, let's say I have a team that's in third or fourth place and I'm sitting on a guy like Chris Carson. Now, he's maybe not the greatest example because he still hasn't come back from his foot sprain. These mysterious 
Joe Mixon, Chris Carson foot sprains where it's like, oh, I'll be good next week. And then, you know, he's seen it practice. And then a month later, he still hasn't played. So we'll see if he comes back. But I think there's some optimism that Chris Carson could come back this week. But he's the kind of player like, you know, if I go to Shane and Shane's in first place and say he had Christian McCaffrey, he was waiting for him to come back and maybe he's not going to get him back now. I go to Shane, I say, okay, Shane, I'm in third, you're in first, or I'm in fourth, you're in first. I'll sell you Chris Carson, and you give me back whatever Chris Carson's price is, so whatever we agree that the price is, whether it's a future first, or it's a wide receiver, whatever it might be, whatever we agree the price is. And then you throw back to me, the the only caveat is in these deals, you want to try to get back, you throw me back, Kalen Balazs. Now, I may never get any use out of Kalen Balazs, right? I may never be able to start him again. But the odds are maybe I can. Maybe I can just get by one more week with him. So I'm kind of kicking my guaranteed Chris Carson every single week. I can start him as long as he comes back. I can play him every single week, most likely. To now, I probably have to fill that hole that he was going to take up. But but the odds that I was going to beat you, even with Chris Carson, I still didn't feel like I had the best odds to beat you. So yeah, I'm making your team a little bit stronger here, but I'm basically playing the variance factor that, hey, what if Chris Carson doesn't come back? What if Austin Eckler doesn't come back? What if I get one or two more usable weeks out of Chris Carson, I get into the playoffs, get the right matchup, and then all of a sudden I can maybe beat you. That's where I kind of want to go to try to have my cake and eat it too. Because next year I'm sitting on the first round pick. Because Chris Carson will not be worth a first round pick in two months. In one month, he won't be worth a first. After the trade deadline, his value goes down just because. You know, he's a risky asset, but it's that kind of idea. And it's hard because, you know, I I would be lying if I said, I don't look at my seven and four team that's in fourth place and go, man, I had some bad breaks, but I can win this thing. So I'm not trading the first place team, anything that would help them out. But I see those teams, the first, the second place team sitting there going, I'm looking for win now pieces. And I found myself even when I know I'm in the playoffs going, ah, do I have any win now pieces I can trade in that team? Because really, you know, you would agree week to week. Like I can tell you, Shane, who would you start this player or this player? And if they're close, it's probably what a 60, 40 bet that I'm going to be right versus you're going to be right. I mean, it's that close. So just because you have the greatest team going into the, the week doesn't mean you're going to win the weekly matchup. So just that kind of idea is just fascinating to me. I'm finding leagues where I see the contenders posting that they want to buy. And I'm a contender. And I'm going, well, maybe I want to sell. Can I get the right value? I'm willing to sell at any time, regardless of the status of my team. Yeah, and I think that's the best, uh, you know, for long term, I think that's the best strategy. Because you end up selling off these marginal pieces for, you know, if things break right, obviously, you, you can always draft badly or you can make future bad trades. But you know, in theory, if you're trading in these marginal pieces to, to gather assets so that you can get one stronger asset later down the road, then you're going to be in good shape. And it is hard a lot of times because, like you said, you're going, oh, I'm seven and four. I'm in fourth. If this went right, I could be in first. If this would have went right, you know, I, I might have been in second. And it's hard to look at your situation and realize, you know what? I'm probably lucky to be seven and four. I'm probably, you know, just because a lot of times we look at what broke wrong for us and forget that, you know what, everyone else in the league had the same issues most of the time. You know, once in a while, there's the one guy that will lose, you know, Saquon Barkley and uh, Joe Barrow and um, uh, Joe Mixon on a week or something like that. We, We all know that there's guys that that happens to because they've, I don't know, built their house on an Indian burial ground or something. But most of the time, everybody in the league, has dealt with something, you know, there's nobody that goes through a season generally. And it's like, well, I didn't have any injuries, you know, that's just not going to happen. So you have to be realistic. You look at your team and you go, you know what, this really isn't a championship team. You know what? Things probably went a little better than I thought they would, you know, cause it's easy to look at and go, wow, I lost Saquon Barkley, but then by the same token, not go, yeah, but I got James Robinson off waivers. Like, you know, that, that's a, that's, sides of the same coin there. Um, you, you can't really blame luck. Um, like I said, there, there are some cases where it just some people are very unlucky and everything goes wrong. Well, then that's just one of those things. But most of the time, luck is one of those things that you either make for yourself or it evens itself out. 
um, at the end. Well, and it's a shrewd move too, because, you know, you mentioned Joe Burrow. Everyone knows I'm a Bengals fan. Unfortunate that that injury happened, but we have to carry on. I mean, we've had so many ravaging injuries this year. You know, I'm a, I'm a Bengals fan. I know you're a former Eagles fan, but I'm a, I'm a dynasty and I'm a fantasy fan first. Let's be honest. I mean, when you're a fan of a team that has been so pitiful over a long period of time, it, it jades you to a point where I kind of expect the worst to happen. It's hard for me to get like super, super biased or excited because I kind of expect, you know, things just never to go perfectly. So I've kind of shifted my focus towards dynasty and fantasy. And, you know, I really, I root for that over my own team. There's been so many times where I'm sitting there going, man, you know, my team might win here, but I don't care. You know, I want the opposing quarterback to go down and score a touchdown. Like that's what I really need. But I found that, you know, when these injuries happen, you know, I, let me ask you this. Let's say you have a team in a league where they're the first place team. They just lost Joe Burrow. They only have one quarterback. You know, you have three. Are you going to that team, especially if you're a team that's one of their prime contenders? I guess it comes down to the fact, are you going to that team and saying, hey, I'll trade you a quarterback at sticker cost. Now you may pay a little, if I'm number two and you're number one, you're going to pay me a tax. If I'm the one you're going to trade with and the shrewd team that's in first that just lost burrow, you're probably not going to trade with the team. That's your biggest contender. Cause they're going to charge you a little extra. So it's all about, you know, the market transaction, but you know, I've even found myself doing that teams that I've seen lost Joe burrow. I'm going, okay, do I have an extra quarterback? Am I willing to trade them? You know, Derek Carr for a first or, Kirk Cousins for, you know, a second and a skill player, something like that, where I'm basically mm-hmm. cashing in. I'm getting the more flexible asset because I'm going to, we're going to do shows like in five months and we're going to be sitting here going, man, I shouldn't have paid that third for that guy in the semifinals of the playoffs because the guy scored two points, tanked my team. Now he's on waivers because I had to drop him because he's useless, AKA Salvin Ahmed, Kalen Balaj, you know, there's going to be a lot of names that people like right now that you're going to get dropped over the course of the next six months. But, you know, that's, that's the measure of a shrewd move. That's the measure of a shrewd dynasty owner that basically it doesn't matter how good my team's doing. The market is always open. Business is always open for inquiries. Um, do you have any examples of that? Can you think of any, do you have any teams where you've gone to the team that lost Burrow and said, Hey, can I maybe try to finagle a deal here? No, but I, you know, in a, it, it was a win move, uh, win now move in another league where I was, I think I'm the seven seed. So, you know, I'm right there and I trade it with the three seed and I gave up Miles Sanders. Um, no, I got Justin Jefferson back, which you could probably argue is probably the better win now move too anyway. But, you know, assuming it's not, I was fine with that because I looked at the long term outlook going, well, I'm in seventh. You know, even if everything breaks right, um, six seed, whatever, you know, Miles isn't going to really going to be helping me in four or five years. Where's Justin Jefferson? Even if he isn't, I can trade him at some point because he's a wide receiver. So his value is going to hold. Um, but no, yeah, to your theory, I, I'd have, again, I wouldn't have a problem trading with that team. Um, it wouldn't probably be my, uh, it probably, be, I would hope I have at least four quarterbacks if it's a three, you know, a super flex league. Um, just because I've learned the hard way the last couple of years that I really need to, uh, stack quarterbacks because there's a lot of mediocre ones that we thought were going to be better than they, uh, ended up being, but yeah, they, they want Daniel Jones, Ben Roethlisberger, Matthew Stafford, Matt Ryan chopped open, you know, come get them. Um, hopefully I can get a player that I can use, but if not, I'm fine with picks too. Cause picks are always, like you said, that's something that's transferable. I can use that anywhere. And especially in leagues that don't have a trade deadline, um, which is most of the leagues we play in. I can use that. I could trade that pick up until the, the championship if I make it there. Um, and I'm fine with that too, you know, and I, I, I did it last year in leagues where I overpaid for Julio Jones the week before the championship. It's fine with me. At that point, it's all in. All chips are in. I'm winning the championship. I'll overpay. And that's what assets are for, you know, to, to win your titles eventually. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I had a patron of mine come to me and ask me about a trade. He said he's of a first place team and he he has Jerry Judy and Antonio Gibson, which 
understandably, those two guys have been kind of frustrating over the last couple of weeks. But certainly you would say they are dynasty assets that are going to appreciate in value over the next six months to a year, uh, given that they've they've both basically already hit as rookies. And he had an offer and it was Allen Robinson and Kareem Hunt for Jerry Judy and Antonio Gibson. And, you know, he's a team that's probably going to be a contender for the playoffs. But I asked, I said, you know, this is an easy deal to decipher for me because I think you would say, how would you see that deal on the surface? Antonio Gibson and Jerry Judy on one side, Kareem Hunt and Allen Robinson on the other side. So you have to hit unmute that just a little editing trick. If you hit unmute, then people can hear you. Um, that's one of those where it's like, well, it's obviously a win now versus win later move, right? You got Allen Robinson and Kareem Hunt, except that Allen Robinson's only 27. So it's kind of, he's going to help you next year too. He's going to help you the year after that. Same with Hunt. Um, I'm fine with that. I mean, we hope Jerry Judy's going to turn into Allen Robinson, right? Like that, that's, that's what we hope one day I'd be fine with that. But you know, that's because he's in that Alan Robinson still, Alan Robinson is still in that nice little meaty 25 to 30 year old zone where, uh, you know, all those guys are still young enough to help me. So I'm fine with that. As long as I can tell myself I can get two years out of this guy, including this season, I'm fine with the trade. Well, and that's the beauty of it because I actually took the other side. I said, listen, you have Judy and Antonio Gibson you're already a team that's in first place. So the the marginal upgrade, and this is assuming that Allen Robinson and Kareem Hunt side is a quote-unquote upgrade. We don't know that for sure. You know, this is a wide receiver for wide receiver, running back for running back. So this is not a, a need-based trade where you're trading one position for another, where you could clearly say, hey, I only have three running backs on my entire team. I need to trade for one. This is a one-for-one, one-for-one. So there really isn't any positional scarcity advantage here. And I just broke it down and I said, listen, if I have already a team that's in first place and I have Judy and I have Gibson, I will more confidently say their value will rise over the next six months. Maybe Robinson's will stay the same or go up a little bit. Uh, He's going to be somebody that could change teams. Uh, Kareem Hunt, we know his situation. I think Kareem Hunt's good, but I think it's probably fair to say he kind of is what he is. He's a, you know, a, a high end RB2 at best. Um, maybe a low end RB one week to week, but he kind of is what he is. He's locked with the Browns, uh, for, you know, basically as long as Nick Chubb's going to be there, Kareem Hunt's going to be there. So we kind of know what those guys are. So I basically said, listen, I want the guys that are going to go up in value because the difference that it's going to make the rest of the season, you know, if I said, Shane, what are the odds that Kareem Hunt and Allen Robinson outscore Jerry Judy and Antonio Gibson? Six, uh, um, maybe 55%, 60% at best. I mean, it's not a I just slam did, dunk. I just ran it. I ran it through the calculator. It's 75, 25. So it's really high. It's really high, really high in favor yeah. of a Robin hunt. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly because I took that side. So that's, yeah, that's the side that's uh, really high. Yeah. That, that's in my shame calculator. I worked it out. Well, but I mean, I think you can go both ways and that's why it's an intriguing trade to me because I broke it down saying, okay, I'm already in first place. So in theory, whatever's gotten me there, unless you say, well, I've lost my two best players over the last two weeks. Okay, well, then you're not a first place team technically anymore. But as long as you can say the team that's got you there is largely intact for the playoffs, I just wouldn't make the move because not only could I lose the bet on which players produce the rest of the season, I think I have a pretty good idea that I'm losing the value bet, at least in terms of which players people are going to want a little bit more going into the off season. So I think you can see it both ways, but that's an intriguing trade that you would never think if you're in the playoffs that you'd rather have the two rookies that you're not really sure of that have been a little disappointing over the last month. You'd sit there and go, Oh yeah, Allen Robinson. Oh yeah. Kareem hunt. Like those guys, I know what they are. They're pretty stable They're I know what I'm going to get from them. You really don't, you don't know what's going to happen. And this is something I've learned this year that has just become more evident to me that With every week, we've talked about it many times already, but with every week, you have COVID stuff, you have quarterback impacts, who knows what's going to happen over the next month. We may see teams pack it in. We may see see teams double down and go back to players that, you know, were really smashing. You you just don't know. So I just don't think those are the kind of bets that I want to make. I'm almost to the point where I'm just taking value. I'm taking value in my leagues, my teams that are already good. I'm just going to ride them. If they win, they win. 
but I really, really think what's going to pay off here come three, four months from now when we start talking rookies and draft. And uh, honestly, both, both Judy and Gibson probably have more, much more value than Robinson and Hunt in six months. Um, just one, because, you know, obviously they're rookies and we love the narrative of, okay, they look what they did their rookie year. So in their second year, they're obviously going to double that production because it's, that's how it works. They're going to double it. And then in the third year, they're going to triple it. Um, so I get that. And you're right. You, you know, if you make the bet on winning the title this year, that's, that's what that move is for. You're, you're, you're trying to win the title this year and then you don't win the title. And then you are left with the older roster, the older players, the players with less value. Um, so I definitely see your side of the argument there. Definitely. Um, well, and it's I, not even, it's not even that they're going to be better as sophomores, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of sometimes the misnomer. And I go down in the weeds sometimes on Twitter with these arguments. It isn't about, Hey, I want Antonio Gibson over Kareem Hunt because Antonio Gibson is going to outperform Kareem Hunt next year. That's not why I want Antonio Gibson over Kareem Hunt. And this is just one example I don't even know if I would necessarily do that trade. I'm just throwing it out there as the one that came up that came to my mind. But the reason is, it's not that I think Antonio Gibson's going to outscore Kareem Hunt next year. It's that I think more people in the offseason would potentially want Antonio Gibson. Right. That's it. It gives me more mm -hmm. flexibility. And we've seen, you know, everybody that's played Dynasty, I'm sure you have some teams. I have some teams where I kind of just feel stuck with the team. I have a bunch of players. They're good. I probably have a good enough team to get me in the playoffs, but it's a roster when I look at it and I'm like, eh, I don't really even like it. Yeah. And when I put the players on the trade block, nobody else in the league likes it either. So you're just stuck and you end up having to pick a path that's like, okay, I'm going to go for it entirely, sell everything out and just try to win. Or I'm selling everybody and you end up underselling. You end up doing it just to do it because I know you're in a lot of ways. I know you're wired kind of like me. I get impatient. If I'm going to blow a team up, it it needs to go like now. I'm not waiting. You know, I see some people say, oh, you know, I'm going to blow this team up, but I'll, I'll let it happen over the course of a season. No, I, I need to blow it up now. I need to get that one in my column of I don't need to worry about it for a little while. And, I, and it's checked off. So I don't have the patience to necessarily say, well, I'm going to rebuild slowly over the course of a season and see what happens. So I, I don't want to be stuck with a team that not that Allen Robinson is not good, but you don't want to be stuck with a team full of 28, 29 year old receivers and running backs in their fourth, fifth year. You nah. just don't because it, it, nah. you're going to run into maybe a league where a lot of people just don't want those. And it doesn't matter what their market value is. If you're in a 12 team league and seven or eight players in your league have no interest in the guy you're trying to trade, his value is not what the market says it is. No, I get it. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Those are the teams like we. The one thing that's remained constant in dynasty is that we hate uh, old players. And I don't think that'll ever change. There's always a subsection of folks that are in the old people and they're always like, Oh no, give me all the 28, 29 year olds. But that's literally like two people in your league, like 10 people in your league. And it's even including me. Like I skew that way too, even though I try not to, you just, it's natural. Cause you go, Oh, your brain goes, Oh, this is a dynasty. I can own them forever. You won't, you'll trade them in two years, but you, you tell yourself, well, I got to own him forever because he's 17 years old. So he's always going to be on my team. Um, so, yeah, anytime you have a team full of 27-year-old, uh, 28-year-old wide receivers and 25-year-old running backs, then you're definitely in that position where you're not going to be able to improve your roster um, because there's only going to be two guys you can trade with in the league or gals. Um, and it'll be the same guys and gals over and over again. Um, just that's how we skew in Dynasty. We like them young. We do. We do. And it's, it's sometimes it's, and it, it's something that you've kind of seen over the last couple of years. And maybe it's cause, you know, there's been a lot more content out there. The discussions about dynasty have exploded over the last few years to where it's all over the place. Everybody's playing dynasty. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, but it seems like a, a lot of the value of players has nothing to do. And i I fall down this road all the time. A lot of values of players has nothing to do with what they do on the field. Has no. nothing to do with how many points they score. Has nothing to do with any sort of projection of what their situation is going to be. I mean, that's built in. But a lot of times, it's just an echo chamber of, I don't want this guy for the most part because nobody else likes him. Nobody really wants him. It's not a commodity that I want to have on my team. It's not the type of asset that I want. And vice versa, 
you know, I find myself investing in players where I'm like, you know what? I don't really believe in this guy. My full, I have full intentions of trading him in the next six months, but I sure as hell know there's like two or three people in my league that as soon as I put them on the trade block, I can get market price for him. Maybe more depending on how they're feeling that day or, you know, what time of year it is, you know, come draft time, I may be able to cash in on more than what I think, because I know that it's somebody that I is going to go up in value. And I know the rest of people in my league, like, so I want to switch gears and talk just real quick, trade deadlines and uh, that kind of strategy, or you want to save that for a future show? We do have a future show, but I was just curious, you know, I, I, I try to play devil's advocate. Is there any legitimate good reason to have a trade deadline that you can think of? You know, it's funny. We did this. Uh, we talked to, we did a whole podcast on this the other day. Shout out to uh, off the rails pod. Um, we talked about trade deadlines and I'm in so many leagues. I know you are. I, I have leagues that th- the rules are all over the place. I mean, it's hard to keep up with, you know, the nuances of each one. I kind of just tend to operate the same in all of them. That There was a league I went today and I posted in the chat, hey, looking to get rid of these players. And someone chimes in, oh, yeah, the trade deadline was, uh, you know, last Sunday. <laughs> oh, well, that sucks for me because I didn't, you know, I didn't post in that chat for the last three weeks. And clearly I just ignored the, you know, notifications when other people were posting in there. But, you know, I don't think that... I don't think that it hurts to vote on a trade deadline at the beginning of the league. Uh, I'm starting to skew more towards not having trade deadlines at all. Uh, I may amend that. Most of my leagues have trade deadlines, which are through the, basically they lead up until the playoff games start. So they don't, it's not the week before. It's not the start of the first game of the last week of the regular season. It's literally like, Hey, the fantasy playoffs start week 14 the Thursday night players of week 14, you can trade those guys up until they kick off. After that, the first playoff kickoff has started. That's the trade deadline. So, I mean, that's usually I push mine out as far as I can, but there is one to eliminate trades literally like in the semifinals of the playoffs. But I found also the ones that have that, no, no trade deadline at all, you don't always get this arms race that happens in the playoffs everyone's scared that like, oh, two teams are going to collude and they're going to load their teams up and I'm going to not want to do that. So I have a disadvantage. You know, I hate no, no playoff trade, trade deadlines. I, I haven't seen that. I've seen it a couple times. And one of the times I was a part of it, you know, I'm, I'm the one searching for deals last year. I had a couple teams where I lost Chris Godwin, DJ Chark, Calvin Ridley down the stretch. And I know those are assets that are going to hold their value. Yeah. And I know my theory on receivers. So I'm sitting there going, okay, Calvin Ridley, who wants to trade him out for another receiver in the same tier? Let's do it. Let's do it. I need three receivers. I need at least, they were all on the same team. You know, I put them all out there. I need two receivers for this week. Let's send me offers. And that's all fair. You know what I mean? And my opponent countered with a deal after I made one. And it's kind of like a little bit of an arms race, but I don't see that that often. So what about you? Not often. And that, you know, the majority of the leagues that I'm in, don't have trade deadlines. And quite frankly, I don't really care if someone makes a trade the day of the championship game. I'm like, good for you because I had the same opportunity to do it. And to me, I think that allows every owner or every uh, league manager to maximize the assets they have on their team. Um, Because if I'm going for a title and I'm willing to overpay for a win now piece, well, that that's only helping uh, the bottom teams, the teams that aren't in the championship, you know, that that's letting them maximize what they have. And for me, you know, I know the risk Um, league. I did it in last year where I kind of traded for Julio Jones the week of the championship. Um, I won the championship this year. I'm three and eight. All right. Well, that's how it goes. You know what I mean? And I knew that was a possibility. Um, The the only time I would think trade deadlines, I always say it's not a, a, a deadline issue. I think it's a league mate issue when people are worried about collusion and things like that. And I understand if it's a league of say 12 to 14 people that all met each other online and that's the only way they know each other. And they're only in the one league with each other. I'd say it makes sense. Then you met each other on the DLF forums. You don't really know them from Adam though, but you know, the leagues we're in at this point, even if I haven't met everyone, I've podcasted with them or talked to them on Twitter or, you know, there's enough trust there where I'm going, these, 
people aren't going to collude. Like, and if they're bad league mates, we'll just kick them out and replace them. So, yeah, I'm always anti uh, trade deadline and forever will be. You make a great point. I think that's the backbone of any rule is. You know, you can't sit there and say, well, Shane made a bad trade. I disagree with it. I want to veto it. I don't trust his judgment on the value that he's making in a deal. So I think if you're in a league where you don't even have to trust everybody in the league, honestly, you just have to know that everybody in the league has some sort of strategy and some sort of base that they're making these moves off of. And when you're in a league long enough, you know, I have some leagues that are four five, six years going now. I kind of know how everyone else is playing. I kind of get what they're typically seeing, you know, how they're building their teams. So you can sometimes spot trends where if it's like something that's completely out of the ordinary and they don't say anything about it, you know, maybe you could see something that seems a little bit suspicious, but for the most part, I don't have a problem. If you, even if I'm facing you in the, in the championship, I don't have a problem. If you make a deal like that, even if you get a good deal, even if, even if you get a deal, one of the things we talked about the other day when we debated this was, I could care less about trade deadlines. If you're on the other end and you're trading, let's say you're the team that's out of it and I'm in the finals and you go, you know, you're probably a, if you're smart, you're posting in the main chat or you're coming to both of us saying, Hey, this receiver or this running back has a smash matchup this week. Who wants him? If you're smart, you're playing both of us. You make the same offer to both of us. You know, I'll take a first round pick. First one that sends it to me gets him. If neither of us do it, oh well. But if you do that, you're maximizing your chances of getting what you want. Yep. And neither person can be upset because they declined it. Now, I may not have a first round pick. I may not like to trade picks. The guy I'm going against might. That person may do it without even thinking about it. And then I lose in the championship. That, But that's my loss. But the idea being, I can respect that trade no matter if it happened to me in the finals against me and I lose, I can respect that trade because you had a process. My opponent had a process. Exactly. It isn't, it wasn't just, Oh, you know what? I like Shane. So I'm going to throw him a nice little market value deal so he can win the championship. You know, if I'm on the other end, you're going to pay a tax, right? Yeah. I've never look, I get along with a lot of people, a lot of leagues, you know, um, no one's ever slid me a discount. Um, you know, it's the opposite, it's just, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, because they know I want to trade, they know my tendencies, and they go, Well, I know showing it, Shane's gonna overpay here, so let me go get them. And that's 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 fine, they should do that. I don't care how good it, my, my mom should do that to me if we're in a league together, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, trade deadlines are just like I said, I think it, it hurts the league activity. It, it doesn't allow the the bottom the bottom teams to actually maximize the assets on their roster. I just I see it in specific situations. Um, but if you know everybody in that league, just just vote on it and get rid of it. Well, no, I- it won't it won't be the downfall of uh, civilization. I promise. I mean, I, I've never had a league that folded because of a trade made after a trade deadline. Not yeah. not once. And like you were saying, I haven't seen any trades really where I'm like, well, that's obviously conclusion. I've seen trades that are bad, but I see trades that are bad in week one and I don't veto them then. So I don't give a shit if the uh, heck if they happen in week 14. I mean, I think that it's fair if someone makes a trade that you think is, oh, oh why did they do that? That doesn't make sense. It's fair to ask somebody to, hey, walk me through why you did it. Explain to me what you were seeing. You know what I mean? If they, if they, If you or I are in a league, People know who we are, you know, that we don't hide our identities and, you know, people know who we are in most of our leagues. They, you know, they can easily search us and find our content, you know, things that we've said in the past or whatnot. So I have no problem explaining why I did something. I'm always going to come to the, I'm, I'm going to support my decision, whether the other people like it or not. And maybe it's the wrong move, but I'm always willing to explain, Hey, this is what I was seeing. This is why I did it. It was strategy. There's always strategy. So as long as you're coming to the table with that, I could care less if you're doing stuff, even if it beats me, you know, even if it beats me in the playoffs. Cause honestly, you know, we talked about it before when we're talking about like the 60, 40 bet, right. Mm-hmm. I, I, there's been times where I've made moves in the, you know, in the playoffs with no trade deadlines. I thought I was getting one thing and I ended up actually doubling down and I lose on both ends. Right. Yep. You lose the deal and you lose whatever you were buying the player for. You lose the week. You don't even win. Yeah. And it, it's like, there's not even a sure thing. There's no such thing as a sure thing 
uh, in fantasy football right now. So I, I don't mind it. Um, the only thing that bugs me a little bit with, uh, not having trade deadlines is if you do have some sort of, uh, I think with no trade deadlines, you do have to have some sort of consolation. You got to give the other teams still reason to kind of pay attention throughout the whole Mm -hmm. season. And, you know, if you don't have like a toilet bowl or some sort of consolation prize, like there's no incentive to keep your team intact going into the off season, right? Like, you know, there's no incentive to say, okay, well, I couldn't trade Adam Thielen. I'll just trade him. I'm just going to trade him away now. So I'm just, I'll just trade him to the contenders. It doesn't matter what I get. I want him off my team, but I'd rather have somebody at least saying, okay, I still want to have the best team that I can within, you know, my value perspective or within the principles that I'm trying to trade with. So that would be the only thing is have some sort of uh, consolation tournament, toilet bowl, you know, prize money that goes to the consolation or an extra pick or something just so that everything is square throughout the rest of the season. That's all. Everyone active and it's fun. Yep. Okay, you know, the toilet bowls, I don't even know which leagues that I'm in that that you even win anything, but I still try to win them if I'm in them because I'm like, hey, it's something to win. You know, some of us give a shit. Some of us care about that, you know, just winning. Um, it's a league that I've already paid for. So whatever. If I could be the toilet bowl champ because I can't win the title because I'm not in the playoffs, then that's fine. Give me something yeah, to play for. I go through and set a lineup in every league every week. Mm-hmm. Even if even if it's if I know I've been out of it for a month, I go in and just set a lineup. It looks good. Yep. Is it absolutely optimal every single time? Probably not. But throughout the, re- I'll set a lineup in every league until week sixteen. Even if I'm in the, you know, the losers consolation mm-hmm. bracket, whatever. That if if I should set a lineup, I should set a lineup. I don't ever want to be that team where it's like. Oh yeah, you didn't set a lineup in the consolation tournament, and it gave this guy the extra second round pick, and it threw yep. off. You know, it gave somebody a free win, and they, had, you know, I, I don't want to ever be that person. So just yep. kind of ride it through all the way to the end of the season. There's going to be plenty of weeks where you don't have to do anything. So always set your lineups. Always. All right. Well, that's this week's man. It can chill. Um, Thanks, yeah, Scott. Where can they find you? Oh, I guess yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Although if you're watching this, it's going to be on a. Friday, so it's probably after Thanksgiving. So happy Black Friday shopping, I guess. Yeah, it's already um, doesn't that already start? All the Black Friday seems like it's already started. Yeah, I've been getting alerts today about all these new phones I need to buy. But yeah, uh, don't forget DLF has their cyber sale this week. Um that started this week. So go hit that up. Uh because then you get to read all the good content from uh Scott and uh the okay content from me and uh all the great content from the rest of the writers. And uh yeah, yeah, that there's all that. Yeah, click the uh, click the tabs below uh, at DLF Football, uh, DynastyLeagueFootball.com. Shane is at Shane is the worst. I'm at Charles Chill FFB, Dynasty Trades HQ, Dynasty and Chill. Uh, we'll try to do a couple more episodes before the fantasy season ends, and then it'll be open season for off-season discussion. Uh, it's usually the – I'll be completely honest with everybody. I'll probably disappear for like two or three weeks after the season ends, just, you know, a little bit of a break. And then it's back to the grind rookie class, you know, what's going to happen in free agency. I think this is going to be a really fun off season after a crazy uh, 2020 season. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody Uh, check out all of our work. Click the links below little alerts should come up during the video. So click those if you didn't already, and we will sign off and see you next time on mannequin show.